Coming up on Tech News Today, get ready to open your Google Wallet as long as you use MasterCard on Sprint with the Nexus S4G. Also, Netflix just seems to be making it worse with their new decision to split in half and OS X passwords get easier to steal. We'll tell you how to protect yourself next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, September 19th, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT9. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. You, you okay there, Sarah? Yeah, I had a weird hiccup there where I was go? like, where am I? <laughs> Who am oh, yeah. I? What order do I go in? It's time for I talk. You know, what's funny is I never actually, like, focus on you when it's your turn to introduce yourself. And that time I did, right, when that happened. Yeah. I apologize. Don't do that, that again. I made you nervous. See, yeah. staring at people makes you nervous. It only took you a couple months. <laughs> now you're where I was months ago. Hey, I was uh, actually reading my Twitter stream. Do you guys oh, excited about Google Wallet? It's official. They well, just launched I, it. Yay. I would be if I had a phone that was compatible, but oh, I don't. You don't have a Samsung Nexus S? No. On, I thought everybody had that phone. No. Yeah. Well, do you have a Nexus S 4G? No. Or do you have a Nexus S 4G on Sprint, as Ayas points out? No. It's pretty particular. Yeah. And do you have a, a prepaid or a city MasterCard? Yeah. Ah, well... You, you can, it, City MasterCard works, or you can just uh, apply for and get a Google prepaid card and hook it up to any account. That is not as limiting as the have to have a Nexus S 4G on Sprint. I'll give them that. Uh, but those are all the conditions that you do need to have if you want to use the Google Wallet. Oh, sorry. You also need to be in New York City or San Francisco. Oh, okay. This is really Where just, a, this is just an now. early test uh, of this. Uh, as a thanks to early adopters, they are adding a $10 free bonus to the Google prepaid card. So you really, you can't afford not to sign up because you get free $10. Yeah, free $10. If, so they're probably giving out, what, a total of like nine of these? Is, I mean, this is very... This well, yeah, I wonder if you have to prove that you have a Sprint Nexus S 4G in order to get the bonus $10. And when you first use it, they'll yeah. give the 10 bucks. Otherwise, I, I bet that's it. the case. Uh, they also announced that Visa, Discover, and American Express have made available their NFC specifications. That's the near-field communication chip that lets you do the wireless payments. That could enable their cards to be added to future versions of Google Wallet. Why do you need the phone? In case you're, you're like, wait a minute, back up. Why do I need a phone at all? It's because of the NFC chip. Uh, you're, they're integrating with MasterCard's pass pay, or I'm sorry, pay pass uh, system. So that when you check out, all you do is you have the phone on and you tap it and you're done. And, and uh, some of the demonstration videos make it look like it's really fast. It's much faster than using a credit card. Even. It's kind of interesting how Google worded this whole um, extra about Visa, Discover, and America, American Express coming on board. It's like, could enable their cards with NFC specifications to maybe be in future versions of Google Wallet. I mean, it doesn't sound like anything set in stone. Yeah, this is a very early step, which is before they had no communication. Now, at least, they've made their specs available to Google, so Google can yeah. start integrating it. Which probably means that they're considering it. Sure. They're considering joining Google Wallet. And why wouldn't they? they if this is going to be Google's juice behind it, and they are going to roll it out to other phones eventually. They said that when they announced this back in May, that you know they'll start with one phone, but then they'll, they'll expand it if the test goes well. They even talked about, you were re uh, reminding us in the meeting there, talking about putting stickers out for people right. who don't they're, have NFC. Google said that if you, did, if you didn't have a phone that had NFC built in, they were going to provide what they call it a sticker. It's probably going to have a lot, little bit more technology than that put it on any phone and go in and, and tap into pay. So it's not like a good idea if if people adopt it. Now Google's got the unenv en unenviable task of educating consumers about this and saying, oh, oh yeah, that phone you have there, you can pay for stuff with that. I mean, that's, even with the little promo videos, that's going to, you know, they have to slowly explain this to like, well, like everybody. To only Sprint Nexus S 4G phone users. Well, yeah, when, some, when, you, when you see somebody who does that, you go, oh, what are you doing with your phone there? So okay. Sprint gets, gets the exclusive here, and that makes mm -hmm. everybody go, ooh, well, maybe I should be on Sprint, because then I'd get to do this crazy PayPal or PayPass thing. And it's kind of an unfortunate similarity, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but in return, Pass I guess pal. Sprint maybe does the education. 
and and sends text messages and well, marketing Sprint, materials. Sprint and Mastercard out. both get to be, um, you know, they're they're part of the the first push, so they get a lot of attention. And obviously, Google doesn't want to just be on Sprint or just have an agreement with Mastercard because then the service won't grow enough. But it's if, good for them. If you do own a Nexus S4G and you've been in an American Eagle Outfitters in the past month. You should know that they were they were accepting it. They were the test for this before the official launch. Their NFC you machines used, look just like ATM. Yeah. Kiosks. Well, and PayPass is already in, implemented in credit cards. So MasterCard's like, look, we already have 300,000 terminals worldwide. This mm -hmm. is not a big infrastructure rollout. Half those terminals are in the United States for the credit card that has PayPass. So any near-field communication phone can use those PayPass terminals eventually. I hope that the little kiosks also have... Um, little power plugs because when your phone dies and you don't have your wallet then it's as if you left your credit card at home that's true uh you also uh you have security in there you have to put in your pin mm -hmm. uh if your pin hasn't been put in lately it prompts you for it again that way if you do lose your phone and somebody's able to get into the phone somehow there's another layer of protection there and it's just like losing a credit card you're going to call the credit yeah. card company and say hey i lost the phone you know, let's let's reauthorize everything before we allow any more charges. Is anybody actually excited that NFC is real and going to be here and we can use it for stuff? Or is it just me? Because I never really carry cash. And this would be a really easy way instead of using my credit cards. Because I leave my wallet, like, at home all the I time. I love the idea. I hate carrying cash. I mean, I. it's funny. We were talking before the show. It's like, well, all right, are wallets going away anytime soon? And people say, what's wrong with wallets? It's like, yeah, we're in the very beginning stages of something, uh, you know, yeah. of, a, of a big shift. No, no, wallets aren't going away anytime soon. Not tomorrow, but that's the right. idea is that your phone becomes your wallet. Exactly. Your ID is going to be in there eventually. Mm -hmm. Your payment system is in there. Your photos already are. Yeah. People don't carry those in their wallet anymore. They carry them on their phone. That's, right. that, you know, that's, that's starting to happen already. So I, yeah, the plastic you know, inserts with the high school senior photo just don't need so that anymore. Your membership well, cards, your, anyways, your membership well, right? cards are part of Google Wallet. They're they're making partnerships so that your loyalty points and everything are counted when you do that NFC tap to pay. It makes things even uh, even faster. I can only think I, of one reason to carry a wallet around anymore. That's not something Google Wallet's going to get into the business of. I have a feeling. I think it's exciting. I love the idea, and I think I'll probably end up spending more for things because convenience tends to make people do that. I'm, I'm convinced as long as the technology works as fluidly as they say it will, or almost as fluidly as it has to in order to replace the same amount of time that it would take me for, to do, for me to do what I'm used to doing, which is to pull out my credit card and swipe it. You know what I mean? If it's going to be laggy because your phone's a little older or you know, weird little things like that. Well, it's near-field communication chip on the mm -hmm. phone. That's mm -hmm. all it needs. doesn't rely... You still, have it, to, you still have to integrate, you, uh, go to your phone and enter in that PIN. Like, there's still that, other steps If you it. haven't entered it lately, yes, okay. but not every time. Okay. It's, I don't know what the expi expiration time is, but the idea is, in all of these videos, is most of the time, you pull out your phone, boom, you tap it. All you have to do is have the screen on. Does the work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it also makes like and we'll see if it works that way well, in real right. life. Though. One review, and this is my next. They did it in a cab. I mean, in the back of a cab, often I'm playing with my phone anyway. So they actually, yeah, right. it's actually somewhat inconvenient to go reach for your wallet and dig out a credit card and swipe and all this other oh, stuff. Oh yeah, that's true. Accidentally drop it because you can lose that one card. Your phone is glowing, okay, when you're tapping it there over there, so you're not mm -hmm. likely to lose it. So I'm like, that's really like I think the the, the killer app for this. You're like, oh, done. I'm gonna leave now. Well, that's why people like Uber so much. It's only in a few major cities, but it's exactly what it does. For ordering cabs, yeah, because yeah. you already they're, paid. And they're twice as much, and you're like, but it's so convenient. Also, Europe and Japan way ahead of us in this whole thing, so if we make our system work halfway decent, it should be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, Netflix made big news yesterday when Reed Hastings uh, put a blog post up and sent out emails apologizing to everyone for the price increase. He said, look, w I messed up. He called himself arrogant uh, and said... Let me explain why we separated DVD pricing and streaming pricing. And he wasn't apologizing for the price increase. He was apologizing for not being a good communicator about why they were doing it. The reason he's separating them is because he's separating the companies. There is a new company now. You probably already heard about this. Quickster will be the DVD rental company for Netflix. Netflix will become the streaming only uh, company. Uh, Hastings is is in the in the blog post thread 
dealing with the negative reaction to this news of the 2,600 plus comments in there. Uh, the uh, the Netflix uh, Andy Rendich, who's been in charge of the DVD streaming part, will become the CEO of Quickster. Quickster and, and Netflix are not separating as companies. They're separating as brands. Uh, apparently, the DVD side of things has already been separated as a def different business unit, and this is just formalizing it to the public. But mm -hmm. to the public, this looks like, hey, if you did decide to stick around and pay $16 a month to get both DVDs and streaming, you're now going to have to maintain two accounts, and your queues won't be integrated. And if you change your address or do anything else, you're going to have to do it in two places. And that is annoying. I mean, I can see where people who have enjoyed the singular Netflix experience online but had the DVD service and the streaming service would feel really put out by this. But the thing is, is that Netflix obviously wants to go streaming. I mean, they have a successful DVD business. That's what they're known for legacy-wise. They still make a lot of money with that part of the business. So it's not like they just have to, they can't just say, well, it's just time to go streaming. Uh, that's just the way it's going to be. Yeah, they don't want to just kill the DVD business. Right. So They want to gracefully sunset it. Exactly. So in, in that way, and because they have issues getting the studios to play nice with them and I mean it's so complicated it's well, like it, it, the studio thing is really interesting because when you have streaming combined with DVDs everybody who just uses the DVDs gets counted as a streaming customer when you're striking that deal right and and the deals have become less about access and more about per customer so as the studios have said look Netflix you're gonna have to pay us a certain amount per customer Netflix looked at it and said well then we need to get the customers that aren't actually using the streaming off of streaming so that we can pay less That's to get right. access to content. Right, because right now the studios are saying, I as can watch all of the movies in the library and Netflix is saying but th but that's not actually how our our brand works so if it's just no he doesn't actually have the DVD service he only has the streaming service he really only has access to a smaller amount of movies so let's make a deal that's half as much as what you wanted in the first place. Well they're saying look we have lots of people counted in our DVD combo pricing before that weren't at taking advantage of the streaming. We're not going to pay you for them. So this is an easy way to account it. No. Saying, look, the people who are in our streaming plan are only people paying for the streaming plan. In fact, they're two separate companies now, so there's no confusion. Now, I'm kind of curious to see where, where Quickster is going to go. I mean, the, the idea that they're going to be a DVD company and that's all they do, I'm just kind of curious if they're going to try to do things like, what if they had kiosks? I mean, Netflix never went into that business. They thought it was a bad idea. But if you're going to be a separate company anyway, where else do you grow at this point? If you're doing it by mail, there's red boxes out there doing this. There's uh, DVD Express, and there's a bunch of these other ones out there. It only seems like a matter of time before Quickster, if it, if it is a real legitimate company, will try to expand even further than just doing mail. So you'd go to Quickster for your, for your box rentals, including uh, video games now, which I thought was, yeah. this is, that got like buried completely. It's like, vi you have video games now? This is a, a big difference, a slight premium on top Quick, of the, Quickster, Quickster will right. be adding in video games at a premium, just like right. you have to just pay extra for Blu-ray. Blu -ray. You'll, you'll get, you'll yeah. pay extra for video games. And some people are excited about that. Sure. I'm just, I'm just intrigued by what these two smaller, nimble companies effectively could do. Could mm -hmm. they... Or is it just going to be like, okay, Netflix owns owns Quickster, so they will just still kind of move slowly? Does not. anyone care what Quickster does? I mean, seriously. I do, yeah. Why? Because there's already... Okay, so right now Netflix was competing when it was one company, when it was competing against Redbox and streaming services. Now it's two separate companies, right? We have Netflix well, They're streaming. not two separate companies. They are two separate brands. Owned by Netflix, right? That's yep. the thing. So if, what are they going to do with Quickster? Like, is this going to make sense for... Quickster is the dying business. Quickster is the blockbuster. Quickster and Redbox is going to die eventually as well. I mean, optical discs are... are, are, are they're at, if, if at anything, they're at their peak now. They're not a growing business. See, that's where I... And that's no. what Netflix has identified. They said, look, the growing business is streaming. We need to get the DVD business out of the way so it's not impeding the growing business because DVDs... The DVD rental business is, is slowly declining. And that's yeah, why Netflix... But they can't the, abandon it completely because they need the money in order to build out their new infrastructure, the streaming infrastructure. That's why I was thinking Netflix, the brand, kept the name on the streaming service. They think that's the future, of course. But uh, Quickster, absolutely. I think, is for those, like, those video files. People who still want to see some serious quality because streaming is good and everything. But you're not going to get 5 or 7 or even 9.1 on a stream. That's just not something that exists right now unless you get some other service, not Netflix right now. They don't sure. do that. Well, and, so. and that, that's same for CDs. CDs are where you go for better quality audio or mm -hmm. LPs. What's the growing business? Streaming MP3s or CDs? So you still make I, I'm money. not disputing you're right, that you're right about the quality, but that's not, that's not where people are, yeah. are spending that's their money. The that's what I'm thinking Quickster's for, is just to kind of 
continue to service this small yeah. bunch of people. I agree. At, because even if you looked at the old pie charts, when we talked about the millions, uh, the one million people they lost, Netflix, when it, before it was two different brands, uh, they still had a lot more streaming than they did DVD rentals. So You know what's kind of interesting about Netflix and Quickster, and so many people have just been lamenting, why did they call it Quickster? It's just the worst name ever. I don't know. I've, I've heard some pretty bad names in this whole Web 2.0 world, but... I think Netflix wanted a name that didn't sound very much like Netflix. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah, and, and Netflix is the brand that everybody knows, and it has right. net in the name. Exactly. You don't make a mail-only service net. Well, someone had pointed out, I think it was in the, the Netflix's blog comments, why didn't you just call it Quickster with an X? It's Netflix, call it Quickster. Maybe they couldn't like, get that. Well, name. yeah, maybe not. But I think that Netflix purposely is trying not to have too much of an overlap between the two. I wouldn't worry about the spelling. I still see emails and, and blog posts about Netflix spelled CKS instead of an X. Well, so yeah, I'm, I'm once not too we get, worried once about we get that. used to stuff, it just... Quickster just, yeah, with a W. You're right. Oh. It, it's going to be Although for a there bit. is Quickster uh, Twitter account, which belongs to one Jason Castillo, apparently of the D.C. area, uh, who just posted that he got offered $1,000, uh, but he says, IDK, you guys should follow my brother. <laughs> He also says, I won't agree till I get a contract, and I'll negotiate. So this guy has been thrust into the limelight. He, he now says, has, I don't know who to trust. He now has 3,421 <laughs> followers overnight. I, I imagine the guy probably just woke up 11 minutes ago when he made this, or 48 minutes ago when he made his first po post of the day. His he Twitter says, account is Damn, for over 3,120 followers just because some people want to buy my handle. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, Jason Castillo is, is experiencing... An unprecedented amount of Twitter fame today, um, and and you know what? Netflix is going to have to buy that Twitter account from. I have to I have to say, hey Jason, yeah. you can hold out for more. Netflix, pay the guy what he's worth. He's <laughs> he's got the name, and he can he can do what is, a lot. What with is that he worth? Name. Over a thousand dollars, obviously. Yeah, obviously over a thousand dollars. Also, also, um, there was one more point I wanted to get to on this Netflix thing before we moved off of it. Oh yeah, the, the, that's it. The reactions. Uh, Netflix approached this in the blog post as, here, I know we messed up with, with the communication around the uh, pricing. Let me explain why. All they've done is make it worse. And yeah, we got a lot of reactions in our, in our inbox. So we, this isn't even from the Netflix blog post. This is a lot of, uh, seems like some angry people. Uh, streaming and DVD by mail are not two different businesses. They are two different ways to get one product. If I want to read Flickr by Theodore Rosak, I can buy it from Amazon.com, whether I want a physical copy or a digital copy. And that's from Catherine, the political scientist. Yeah, but, but also Netflix is a service, not a store. So that, that's, I don't know, Catherine, if I buy that as an analogy. Uh, this is about Reed Hastings' apology. To apologize for tripping me is one thing, but to offer to make amends by jumping up and down on my head is simply too much. Uh, that's from uh, I Joseph think that, Hauger. That, that's telling to Netflix of how people feel about the idea of splitting the company in two. And then a person, uh, Jeff Lake, saying that uh, if, there, if Netflix isn't careful, Apple and Amazon will pounce. Well, that's, that's a possibility. And uh, the last reaction here was from the ridiculous email that Reed Hastings sent this morning has made me wish that I had some hills to scream to. That was Nancy Mellon. Maline. Maline, excuse me. I went to high school with her. Well, there you go. But that wasn't all that was. We also got some a lot of forwards of that email because Reed Hastings sent out that email that uh, I think we got like 10 of those forwards. And uh, some pretty even-handed. Some, some angry, some just forwarding and one person who didn't seem to care, which I thought was very odd. Reed is in the trenches on the blog post trying to explain all this stuff, but I'll tell you what, it's a losing battle. The only thing that is going to turn the tide for Netflix in the, in the attitude about this is what Their they said collection. about additional streaming content. Mm -hmm. uh, Hastings said, we have coming in the next few months substantial additional streaming content. It better be. If it is... All, all, all things will forgive it. I mean, the, the public will forget like that and go, wow, you have, like, the entire run of Star Wars in HD on Netflix? We're there, you know? Obviously, they're not going to get something that huge, but it's got to be like that. It's yeah. got to be close to that in that arena to be, make people think, oh, the, you know, the entire library of television is now on Netflix. For, uh, you know, I've forgotten all about everything. That's, that's you know, a great point. Back in our prediction show, I always think about this every time some crazy Netflix story comes up. You said this is the year to watch Reed Hastings, and it really is. 
Did no, I, I mean, that? I don't know what we're going to be saying. Yeah, you did. It was what? last December. I don't know what we're going to be saying at the end of the year. Yeah, right. But it has been a very interesting year for Netflix. All right. Coming up on Thursday, F8 begins. That's Facebook's developers conference and has become the trend. Developers conferences are where we get a lot of news about what companies are going to do. Uh, both the New York Times and The Guardian in the UK have apparently special leaks about what they'll be announcing. New York Times confirming that Facebook will launch a media service, will unveil a media platform that will allow people to easily share their favorite music, television shows, and movies, effectively making the basic profile page a primary entertainment hub. Guardian calls it a, a, a music ticker. Uh, and, and a lot of the talk about this is they got, they got an interview with the uh, president of MOG, and uh, the president of MOG was saying, we'll make it easier for people to listen to something that is linked to without having to log in. So on Facebook, if you send out a link like, hey, I'm listening to this song right now, any of your friends can click on it and listen to it as well without having to sign up for that particular service. With all this, with all these music services going with one free way or another, RDO did it and Mog did it and Spotify is free right now, I know that a lot of people are trying out different services. And to try to share this stuff is actually somewhow inconvenient. By going through Facebook, I mean, I'm, I'm, cause my wife wants to use Mog and I want to use Spotify and I yeah. want to share this, the, the content. It becomes a lot more difficult. And if Facebook has the kind of hooks that they can actually make everything work together, it might be a little easier to share music because at the end of the day, it's kind of what you want. You want to know what your friends are listening to and maybe find new music that way. So I'm kind of excited that this might actually happen finally. I'm too. Uh, I, I am too. I, I, I love music discovery and I actually love social music networks like this because they help me know what people are, you know, what, what, what friends that, uh, of opinions I, I care about are listening to. And I learn a lot of stuff that way. Facebook is so big, though, that I wonder, Amber and I were ta talking about this on the social hour this morning, is it going to help Spotify, for example, rise to the top? I mean, because Facebook, whatever it ends up giving the most attention to will help that service skyrocket because of all the users. Yeah. Not everybody on Facebook is even going to care about this stuff. Although they're saying, the Times is saying Spotify, Rhapsody, Ardio, Mog, and Deezer, a French company, including and Vivo, the video uh, music sharing site, all will be part of this. So w I think the idea is it doesn't, Facebook's not picking a winner. Whatever service you use can then be shared on Facebook. But that's like saying Facebook has, you know, 10 games you can play, but then there's always the clear favorites. Yeah, but it's, it's also like saying you can share links to news stories on Facebook. It's not like Facebook favors the New York Times over the Washington Post over CNN. You're just sharing links. No, so but it's... So it's where, wherever you already live is, is where you share sure, from. Sure, but if you're like, I don't know anything about these music services and I share a Mog link with you, you might be like, this Mog thing looks pretty cool. I might sign up. Right. Well, then that is based on whatever's popular amongst your friends. True. So the Facebook has still got their hands out of that. So you're saying that Facebook will have, will not influence what music service may or may not gain more popularity, at least in the Within U.S. Within their bubble. Now, if you're a Groove Shark and you're not part of this deal, then yeah, yeah. You're, you're not. You're hurting because all of a sudden, all the Facebook people are going to be looking at other services and not you. Exactly. Uh, Zuckerberg also expected to introduce changes to the like button, allowing developers to create their own verbs, like want, desire, the need button, Ugh. the funky mm -hmm. button. I guess you Funky? I don't know. You can call it whatever you want, right? Well, it's not so horrible. I mean, sometimes, you know, somebody writes, I got injured today, and somebody just wants to say that they're acknowledging it, and they end up clicking like, which is the wrong word yeah, that's for true. the situation. That's very true. Yeah. So maybe it I might like be like sympathy injured. or some other word for that, because sometimes you have these, like, bad tales well, that on the Wii button. Will, the character, will there be character limits? Because, I mean, I don't know. that we'll like button might get really long. Really, 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 I mean, really. I have sympathy, really, sympathy for you. For you. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Let's take a quick break and thank our sponsors at Squarespace. Squarespace. Space.com is fast and easy to use. You don't have to worry about updating the software yourself. You don't have to worry about bandwidth limits. You know what you're paying for and you know what you're getting. They will adjust to it as it go along. You're not running your own server. You focus on making the site look good. And if you're like me, you're like, I don't know how to design sites. It's perfect for you because you go in and pick a template and they make it look great. And then you can pick some colors and stuff to make it fit exactly what you want. Maybe add an image or two. But you don't have to know a bunch of cascading style sheets or a bunch of code to make a great-looking website. And then that other person out there who's like, Aha, Tom, well, I've got you. I like CSS, and I want to tweak it exactly the way I want to. Well, you can do that, too. Squarespace allows you access to the source code. In fact, I do it both ways. When we do update Sword and Laser, uh, I actually use their WYSIWYG editor because it's easier to enter the content. And then I'll go in and make a couple of tweaks with tables 
rules and spacing and stuff in the code because I know how to do some HTML. So it's really easy, really fast, the perfect way to make a high quality, good looking website uh, that will get your name out there. Or maybe, maybe you want to code it for some friends. Uh, maybe you want to start a little business where you, you get them set up on Squarespace, make it look good, and hand it over to them. Any way you use it, go to squarespace.com, and if you decide to buy it, you get 10% off for six months when you use the code TNT9. Now, this may be, we had all this talk about credit cards earlier in the show. You're like, well, wait a minute. I, what kind of payment do I have to put down to try this out? Try it for free. Free trial at squarespace.com. You don't even need to use a credit card. Uh, you just go up there, create the site, import it, from whatever blog you have, just just import your blog to see what it looks like in Squarespace. I think you'll like the way it looks. And then if you decide to keep it, use the code TNT9 and get 10% off for six months. We thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. I guess last Wednesday we missed this. Uh, they uh, made an announcement at the Build Conference that all Metro apps, those are apps made in HTML5 and JavaScript for the Metro interface of Windows 8, that big tile interface, will have to be sold through Microsoft's own store. Uh, that according to Ted Dworkin. He is the Microsoft director who leads the Windows Store development team. They put up a primer about the store. Now, originally, that primer said that they would take 30% of all sales through the store and give the developers 70%. They've since removed that reference. Uh, and said that they're not ready to announce details, but it sounds likely that that's what they'll do. They all, Dworkin also said that they will examine every application submitted to the store and run a virus check and a malware check on every one of these applications. So they're going to tightly curate the store for Metro the way an iOS does or the way, you know, pretty much everybody but Android does. Even, even the Android marketplace has a little bit of curation, uh, whereas the x86 applications that run on the desktop of Windows totally clear, totally free and open the way it is today. Anything that will compile and run, you can run. It's a caveat emptor. Again, we've got these two ways of doing things trying to coexist on one platform here. Metro is going to be locked down. It's not going to be available for just anyone. You're going to have to go through a curation process, whereas on the desktop, it's wide open. So theoretically, the Metro interface, though, any apps you get, since they're going through the store only, and they're being checked for viruses, they should all be safe. There shouldn't be any malware in there. That means that the Metro interface doesn't need to have any background applications theoretically running to keep tracking these kinds of things. Even though Microsoft is building in Defender, which is going to protect the other end of the Oh, yeah. Well, saying. Defender will already be running, so that's not going to save I'm you. Just, I'm just kind of curious. Well, maybe you don't want that kind of thing on an ARM processor. You don't want things you know, eating up processing cycles when you can just go, hey, all these apps are, oh, are nobody, safe. Nobody's going to tell anyone to turn off their antivirus while running Windows. Are you kidding me? That's just crazy talk. It's crazy talk, but it can be done. It's that is not the point of this. The point of this is to curate that that store and make money off of it. The point of this is to to get all to have the advantages of a tablet uh, interface in that store at the same time that you can also sell the same piece of software for a desktop application and not change anything. They're trying to eat their cake and also still have it sitting in front of them. <laughs> True. Well, and they're also taking into their own hands that uh, there's not going to be malware and viruses on these Metro apps. But that's the thing. I know that's what Ayaz is saying, too. But I, I, think, I don't think you can ever guarantee that somebody won't have some x86 process running in the background. I mean, they're never going to tell anyone, turn off Windows Defender. Well, that's that, fine. That's but just if, suicide. If you're going to try to have the public uh, see you as a legitimate iOS competitor with a very similar format, then you better make sure that you have clean apps. Well, that, that's true. But at the same time, I can go put an unclean app back in the desktop area that's already there right, as that's, well. That's the choice you're making, right? You can go, you can go through this safe app store, right? This whole closed, right. closed wall kind of thing, or you can go to the desktop anytime you want and basically muck around the system if you want. You're telling me somebody won't figure out no. how to go to Internet Explorer in Metro nope, and install that. a piece of malware in the in the x86 area, even though you thought you were only ever using the Metro apps. It's going to be the uh, story one day. You know that's going to happen. Same thing will happen with Android, happened with iOS, where there were things running in the background that weren't supposed to, accessing APIs that they never said they were, the developers never said they were, were doing that. Windows Phone had the same vulnerabilities. That's a natural. So a natural why not just situation. allow sideloading? They're going to allow sideloading for enterprises and developers. Why not just allow anybody to sideload if they want to? Do it the way Google does with Android. I don't understand locking it down all the way when it's not really locked down. The system isn't protected anymore. Well, they're trying to please, what, two different sides, right, at the mm -hmm. same time still. They're like, okay, look, 
This is safe. That's the problem. No matter what. So, yeah, so you have yeah. this weird situation. You like Windows? You've got Windows. But that, now but you, you have a new Windows, too. But there, you could have that same safety by even allowing side loading because I'd have to have a certain level of sophistication to know how to side load an app. Or you could have an x86 application, side load an application to Metro, blah, 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 virus there. You well, exactly. Somebody's going to, and somebody's going to jailbreak this thing the way they've jailbroken Windows Phone 7 and allow for side loading anyway. So why make it tough? I just don't understand that. I'm missing something, I know. There's some good reason why. I don't think it's security. Although that may be what it they think. It could just be revenue. It could be as simple as that. 30%, get the apps through here. Here's some money. There you go, I mean, right? The revenue is usually a really strong driving That's force. That's kind of a motivator for businesses. For but allowing side-loading <laughs> isn't That's a crazy really, idea. Allowing side-loading isn't hurting Google's revenue on Android. But... That's all I'm saying. Microsoft is in a tough position, though, because they really want people to... Uh, the, there's a trust issue that they really need to make sure people have with them yeah, but if Google's they're going primary, to be adopting Windows 8. I'm sorry, I just had the thought as I started saying that. Uh, Google's primary business is not you know, software, right? Mm. Their stuff is search and advertising. Right. They're making money somewhere else. They don't care as much. Microsoft was software, software, software. Then, like, look, we got to do software as a service or we're in trouble in the long run. But they're making plenty of money off Windows now and they don't have a store that locks everything down. They, I know that. I think it's Balmer said this several times. We have to keep building revenue streams. We have to keep doing these kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, I'm not saying they shouldn't do the store. I'm just saying don't stop me from being able to sideload. I, I, especially then, uh, with HTML5. If, it could run in a freaking that browser. Attitude, that's just ridiculous. Clearly you will be able to sideload. <laughs> yeah, not, exactly. That's not an issue. It's like, it's why, why, why make it harder? That just, that just seems silly. For fun. Uh, a couple of smaller stories. Well, one of them is a smaller story. AT&T is apparently going to Metro P PCS and Leap Wireless to try to sell them Spectrum and subscribers as part of an attempt to mollify the Department of Justice, who are objecting to AT&T's bid to buy T-Mobile. Bank of America Corp. is apparently advising AT&T on the potential asset sales as a way to compromise for the deal. Tom Crasset of Paid Content asks, after all, if the world is truly competitive, why would you want to give your competitors any kind of help? He, he makes the argument that AT&T is undermining their own argument by saying, look, we need to buy T-Mobile because we need their spectrum. But at the same time, we can sell some spectrum to Metro PCS and Leap if you think we end up with too much spectrum. Right. Shaky argument. But they can also say, listen, AT&T has said th this is a, you know, for us to not be competitors anymore and, and for us to gobble up T-Mobile is a good thing. But if it means that the bid isn't going to go through and the government's going to shut it down, then we're willing to make some concessions. It doesn't really admit guilt. No, but it also they doesn't address the problem. Right. If, if you're the Department of Justice saying, you know what, you're going to end up with too much spectrum and there's not enough competition, you don't go, well, hey, we'll go prop up the competition and, and we'll give them some spectrum. Well, they're propping up not... I don't think you understand, at t <laughs> They're propping up really tiny little competitors, though. Well, yeah, I, I, I think that makes it even worse. I, I'm Does not sure. It? I'm I not, think that they're like that. These guys aren't going to like. There's going to be plenty of prop over competition as long as we prop it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. It's not. It, ATT is not going to do anything that hurts them. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, and finally, uh, OS 10 passwords can be changed by any local user. Uh, this is uh, some research uh, that has been done by Defense in Depth, a blog that covered a previous method for cracking OS X passwords that was a little harder. Uh, in Lion, it actually becomes a little easier. Uh, in Lion, the system holds password hashes in the system's directory services, not just in shadow files. Shadow files is where OS X has typically stored your hashed passwords, uh, and that is only accessible to a high privileged user like a root admin now there's there's ways to gain access to root and get to those but you would have to be logged in as an admin to get them in lion because the password hashes are available in something called directory services the hashes can be extracted without needing to supply root access without needing to be logged in as an admin so any user account can access any other user accounts password hash and then you could reverse engineer them, run them through a script and crack them because you see the salting uh, in there as well even scarier apparently uh, they also can use the directory service command line utility uh, to change the password for any account because it doesn't require you at the command line to enter the previous password to change another. So as soon as you, uh, you are logged in on any user account, you can change any other user account, including Root's password. That's a major issue. Now, the attacker needs to already have local access to your machine. So this may not be as bad as you're thinking. They either have to be physically at your machine while it's logged in or already have a user account and password to get in. 
so th there has to be a, a little bit of access to begin with. It's not like anybody can just log in from, from anywhere else. Uh, once they get that local access, then they can get access to that directory. So the, the tips to keep people from exploiting this vulnerability in OS X are things you probably should be doing anyway. Disable automatic login. Don't have the computer log in as soon as you turn it on. Enable sleep and screensaver passwords, or just don't use screensavers. And anytime it goes to sleep, make it have you log in again in order to get back to the account. Uh, disable any guest accounts unless you really have a need for it. You don't need a guest account on your, on your computer. And don't always run as admin. Have user accounts that have lower privileges for every single person and restrict those user accounts from accessing apps like Terminal that can modify directory services, and you should be okay. I, I, think, uh, I think we could probably expect Steve Gibson may address this on Security Now this week. And then one way or and Apple needs to put out a security patch for this like a pretty quickly. Or then again, it is something you can take care of by clutching your laptop all the time. Make yeah, sure I nobody touches it. I think if you it. want to be really yeah. safe, you don't want to leave your house. And you certainly don't want to invite guests over because they might uh, be bad people. Exactly. Who get into your computer when just you go to the Just don't let people log on to your laptop. Exactly. And the best way to do that is just Not to have just by bludgeoning quarantine them with yourself. Your laptop. Oh, that's a better idea. Yeah. Let's move on to the news views. Richard Stallman, the free software pioneer, has written an article at guardian.co.uk questioning if Android is really free software. Stallman, the man behind the GNU project and the free software movement, takes great issue with Google withholding source code to Android 3 and 3.1. He does not think that products using Android respect users' freedoms since they often use proprietary drivers and Google's YouTube and Maps. He also points out that only the GNU license applies to the Linux parts of Android. There are other parts that are under the Apache software license, which is more restrictive. He doesn't like the Apache software license, just put it that way. He says, quote, the point of free software is that we have control of our computing, and this doesn't qualify. Now, this is just Android 3 and after, so it's sort of a change in Google that has provoked the liony anger of Mr. Stallman. All right, here's a new one. <clears throat> Ready? Samsung is going to sue Apple. Get out what? of here. Yeah, no, it's true. The Korea Times says Samsung is just waiting for Apple to release that iPhone 5 before seeking a ban of its sale in Korea, claiming patent infringement. The Times cites an anonymous Samsung executive. In a present lawsuit news, in present lawsuit news, Samsung has filed a counterclaim against Apple in Australia. Those two crazy kids. They won't stop. They can't get along. The largest defense contractor in Japan has announced that it was the victim of a cyber attack. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries reported it first noted an attack, noted an attack on the 11th of August. Approximately 80 systems were infected with malware, and the hack targeted the company's missile, submarine, and nuclear power plant component business. So that's um, bigger news than Samsung. We've been talking a lot about Pantech lately. Verizon is going to offer customers a $99 LTE phone this Thursday. It's the Pantech Breakout. Uh, that price tag comes with a lot of the usual trade outs You'll need a two-year contract, uh, minimum two-gigabyte data plan. You'll also have to redeem a rebate to get that price down, say you have to pay them $100, and then wait for the $100 to get sent back to you, which seems like a pointless exercise. I don't know why people do stupid rebates. It's ridiculous. The breakout has some pretty decent specs, though. A 4-inch touchscreen, 800 by 480 res, Android 2.3, which I guess Stallman considers to be free software, hotspot capabilities, and a 1 gigahertz single-core processor. I wonder if it'll have an Atari emulator so I can play Breakout. I have an Atari emulator on my phone. Do you play Breakout? I can. I haven't bought it. I think it. you should. Yo, I play dog, Adventure. I got Breakout I on my should. Breakout. And then so. to say to your next person you know that has a Breakout phone, check this out. Can your phone do this? Break it on my breakout. <laughs> Speaking of gaming, it appears that gamers may have figured out how a critical protein is created which could lead to a breakthrough in combating AIDS and the HIV virus. Researchers from the University of Washington released a game called Fold It, where players were challenged to predict the structure of a protein called retroviral protease. It's involved in HIV multiplication. So if this is the first step in gamers eventually saving the world, I, for one, welcome our new overlords. Gaming overlords. Awesome. This is my next obtain some images of a brand new Motorola Android tablet. It appears to be a 7-inch honeycomb power tablet. They got that information based on the uh, camera app that's running. The device looks to be slimmer than the 10-inch Motorola Zoom, and it also has uh, design cues from the F Photon 4G with angled corners. Also in the picture in the background, uh, that could be a Droid HD, but, I mean, who would notice that? Like, Jason? 
Do well, look at that. I don't know if I would have, would have noticed that with the with this one in the forefront. I thought it was a Samsung Galaxy S2 or maybe an iPhone 5 because I can't tell the two apart. I think it's just a wallet. Same design. <laughs> Rogers Communication is under pressure by Canada's telecom regulator to stop throttling gamers. The CRTC, Canada's FCC, wants Rogers to present a detailed plan by the 27th of September to stop the misclassification of game traffic. Rogers had been throttling games like World of Warcraft because the ISP thought game traffic was P2P traffic. Because you know what? Blizzard uses P2P for legitimate reasons. P2P is not a crime, people. And Rogers, you've got about a week to change. Shuhei Yoshida is promising PS Vita users that firmware upgrades will definitely be a more pleasant experience than updating a PS3. Without saying how, he has implied that updates will be less intrusive. Yoshida also mentioned on Twitter that the Vita will be region free. Sounds like there's going to be a great time for people to make some money by exporting Vitas from Japan when it's released there in December and not here. Everybody needs an app store, and apparently Opera needs two. The browser maker just bought <laughs> Hamster, which has a large library of Android content and runs a white-label app store platform that it offers to network operators, handset makers, and other application stores. Hamster also supports Java, Symbian, Windows Mobile, and BlackBerry applications. Opera launched its own mobile app store in April of this year. Hamster will now become a part of Opera software. Hamster. Hamster, not hamster. Not hamster. Hamster. Stir. And that story goes out to all the opera lovers in the house. And those who thought Quickster was a stupid name. Time for the randomizer. Randomizer. Uh, this was one of our top technewstoday.reddit.com stories today from Discovery News. Uh, it's a New York design firm called Atelier DNA that has a concept that gets rid of blades in windmills for wind-generated power in favor of stalks. They're like thin cattails, and they generate electricity when the wind starts them waving like wheat fields. So, first of all, it doesn't hurt the birds because they don't get hit by the fans. doesn't look nearly as ugly as these big windmills that are up on the side. It's just a lovely, flowing field of waving power generation. I mean, it looks like it could potentially need more surface area on land, but it kind of has a nice vineyard appeal. But don't people hate vineyards with the way they look? This, this is going to look like people like what grass. comes out of it. See how far right. the city is from yeah. the actual picture? Very far away because nobody wants these things in their backyard. Every time there's a, a clean energy thing like those uh, turbines that basically are bird blenders, this thing is going to look ugly and people will complain well, about it. Kids won't too. like it because you can't hide in there. Yeah. And that's the fun Somebody thing about might a cornfield. But you won't get ticks. Well, that's good. I think if you're flying by, it might actually look like Earth is unshaven. <laughs> like, like it has a little bit of stubble growing. You have yeah. a problem with beards? This does look very <laughs> follicle-like. It's the Earth's soul patch? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> all right. More the soul Earth's patches soul save patch the birds. will save us all. <laughs> On to the calendar. Today is International Talk Like a Pirate Day again. Uh, we do this uh, every year. Actually, I like the Wired article that teaches you how to actually talk like a Somali or Yemeni pirate. Oh, it's talk like a more Say specific things kind like, of where pirate. is the captain? Put your guns down. There we go. Everyone be quiet. I, I haven't participated this year. I think I the rise like... of Somali pirates have kind of taken the fun out of Talk Like a Pirate Day. Well, yeah. How okay. dare they? They right, no, I mean the fact that we have serious pirates that kill or people has taken some of the fun out of it. Or maybe we could we could extend it to be like, hey everybody, let's get on BitTorrent. Talking like a pirate. <laughs> no, nobody's seeding you're, this. You're talking my Why is nobody <laughs> seeding Your share the ratio complete is family ties torrent, man? I'm talking like a pirate. <laughs> All right, so happy International Talk Like a Pirate Day. I feel like it's like Talk Like a Pirate Day about four times a year, but I guess Arr. it's only once. In 1982, Professor Scott Fallman at Carnegie Mellon first typed a, uh, a, a what is that? Colon. Colon, colon dash, 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 close right. parentheses, on a bulletin board at 11.44 a.m. on a computer science uh, department bulletin board. And the smiley emoticon was born. And now to this day... Now, there's dispute about whether he was really the first, but he's recognized as... Back in the 1800s, Abraham Lincoln, uh, in one of his famous speeches... Wow, going deep. ...about the Great War, um, yes, had it typed out... The Great for, War? It was, well, it was, that was like the name of the speech. The civil, like a I mean, great, the Civil War. Well, but it, the name of it at the, the time speech, was... Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, okay. And it was typed out, and archivists have this typed out version where there's a, uh, it's like a winky face. But he was actually saying, like, wait for applause. It's a typo. It's a typo. Oh, wait a minute. The first draft actually <laughs> said LOL at the end. the technical so. winky face was penned by... Accidental winky face. President Lincoln. Yes. Well, you don't know that for sure. 
Anyway, uh, I'll, we'll go ahead and give this one to Scott Fallman. Thank you for the emoticons. Apple has posted on its developer forums that iCloud backup data will be reset on Thursday, September 22nd. And the functionality, which is currently still in beta, won't be available again until 5 p.m. Pacific that day. Likely indicates that iOS 5 is pretty close to being done. Ever since iCloud started in beta, Apple has told developers none of this data will be permanent, and so this is the first time they've said, and this is the date that we're going to wipe it all. So yeah, that seems like a good sign. Tomorrow on September 20th, HTC has invited us to celebrate in style. So based on what their little press release looks like, which is kind of a, a mauve scarf blowing in the breeze, it's possible that this could be the release of the woman-targeted Bliss phone. Um... Or maybe they're going to get into purses. Yeah, or maybe they're going to sell scarves. Could be. Because when you're holding a phone, nothing looks better than a nice scarlet scarf. I don't accessorize my phone properly. I know that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the new, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, we don't know what it's going to be, but that's my best guess anyway. Also tomorrow on the 20th, Gears of War limited edition Xbox 360s are coming. Now, these were announced back at E3 in June. So here's what you get. 400 bucks for a special kind of blood red nice. themed gears themed Xbox 360 console, 320 gigabyte hard drive, two matching wireless controllers and a copy of the game. I like the look of that thing. I, I mean like it's 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 not for every living room, but it's it's got style. All right, let's check what's incoming. <laughs> Ouch. Rich in formerly that. lovely Cleveland. By the way, Rich is setting a high bar for you people. We've, we've been reading his stuff a lot, and that's only because it's good. Uh, it says, I don't think Microsoft should fool around with emulation like Apple did with Rosetta in the Intel Switch. Apple switched over to Intel chips because they had hit a performance and thermal wall with PowerPC. Microsoft is coding for ARM only for the power savings. By all accounts, ARM can't hit the same clock speeds or core counts than x86 can right now. This may change in the future, but I think it will be a while until power users see ARM as the best architecture for Windows. If Microsoft is really trying to improve their user experience, slow and inevitably buggy emulation is about the worst way to go about it. It's a good counterpoint. Uh, but Hyper-V is virtualization, not emulation, and that could be an answer. But wouldn't ARM have to emulate x86? Instructions. Yeah. That's the problem with that because when, uh, when Apple tried it with, uh, they actually there was I think it was like called Pair PC. You could run Windows on on a Mac on on Power PC. That was a whole just a nightmare. Oh yeah, the old Windows three point one. When you had full yeah, virtualization yeah. like on with the Intel Macs, it was a lot easier to do that kind of thing. So I mean even I mean Apple came out with Boot Camp. So yeah, go ahead, knock yourself out. Yeah, he's got a good point. All right, I can dream, can't I? No. Thanks to everybody on our Reddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, Compfixer87, SP Sheridan, Canuck, PC Guy8088, Draconos, Captain Kipper, and more, all submitting stories in there. Go in, submit stories, or even just vote things up or down. Let us know what you're into. That's how we got the generating wind power without rotating blade story. Thanks to SP Sheridan. Technewstoday.reddit.com. That's it for this edition of Tech News Today. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can call and leave us a voicemail. 260-TNT-SHOW is the Google voicemail number. And you can email us, and you can email us links to video mails or voicemails or whatever you want. TNT at twit.tv is the email address. We'll be back tomorrow with special guest Patrick Norton from Techzilla. See you then.